Okay, so the stuff in the middle that is missing, because it basically hasn't been built lately, quite a lot of it in lots of places. Uh, and this represents a lot of choices that aren't really available if it's only a house or only a mid-rise building. So these days, uh, I should let you know that um, I come from a disgraced profession. I'm, I'm a real estate developer. And I teach other people how to be real estate developers, typically at a very modest scale in their neighborhood, uh, before people from out of town figure it out. And I've also been a home builder, planner. I can play an architect on TV. But I dropped out of high school, so I don't have any inflated idea about how important I am. <laughs> Wait, I forgot to ask. Any architects in the room? <laughs> don't tell them. Um, so what, what I've found is that more and more people in the, in the building and development business tend to specialize. You can find people that only do CVS stores in a three-state area, three, three area. And, you know, if you ask them, it's like, oh, yeah, no, I've been with CVS for 10 years, happy to work in the three-state area, you know. And you ask them about Walgreens, and it's like, oh, don't talk to me about those people. They have 17 floor plants. That's crazy. They have 13 different versions of the dumpster enclosure. It's just, CVS, we have three stores, one dumpster enclosure. I'm focused, right? As a developer, if you were like a doctor, you would be like a urologist for males between the ages of 23 and 24. That's like all you could focus on. Common cold can't help you, got to focus on this stuff. Mm -hmm. So the level of specialization, people only build uh, starter homes, or maybe starter homes and first move up houses, or maybe just garden style apartments, which by the way, are rarely distinguished by their gardens, right? But carport apartments didn't test very well for marketing, so we didn't go that way. And there are people who just do self-storage, you know. And there are people who just do office buildings, but not medical office buildings, you know. So the, that level of specialization happens because the business is kind of complicated. Um, the, it's hard to know that you have a solid approach to getting your approvals at the city, getting your financing at the bank or with your partners, uh, staying married, you know, it's all, you know, it's all very stressful. It's a lot of information to be able to process. So people tend to specialize. Also the financing for whatever you want to build is very neatly divided into, you know, this is financing for mini storage. This is financing for a hotel. So that level of specialization has kind of carved out all of this interesting stuff in the middle. But I live in an older neighborhood. It was a railroad town. And now we're looking at infill, kind of one 50-foot lot at a time. We're redeveloping a, a 1962 Volkswagen dealership, uh, mostly food and drink and some new mixed-use buildings, two blocks from my house. And my interest in this stuff is that we need to be able to build things that fit in with existing communities. And if you have to build something really big, it's probably not going to fit in. And it's going to take a lot of capital. Um, and you're probably going to be coming from the other side of town or another state when you do it. It's not something that is the provenance of local folks. You're not going to get together with your brother-in-law, the drywall contractor, and you know, build a modest little building. It's going to have to be big. So this is an attempt uh, that's going on all over the country for people to build things that are in context, in scale, uh, paying attention to the local economy, you know, looking for, uh, for local tenants, right? I don't know about you, but I don't think the world needs one more Subway sandwich place. I think we have enough of those. Uh, and I don't think there are enough places to get a proper po' boy, thank you very much. So let's roll through this, okay? Here's the questions. So the... You know, at the end of Reading Rainbow, where LeVar Burton tells you you can go to the library and the books you ought to read, this is, these are the books you ought to read. So, uh, Missing Middle Housing, written by uh, our friends uh, Dan Parolik and Arthur Nelson, uh, goes into some detail. It, 
If you are a community development zoning geek and you don't have this book, you may get your membership card you know, revoked because this is important. This other one is more for developers. It's called Building Small. And uh, it's published by Urban Land Institute. You know, so it was kind of a breakthrough book for them. Uh, and the, the author of this book runs uh, twice a year uh, you know, get-togethers. They just had one uh, a couple months ago in San Antonio where they show, people show off projects that are local. They tell you know, stories about what went wrong, what went right. And because it's developers talking to developers, we save our exaggerations for civilians. So you're getting the real talk in, in, among people that are actually doing it. Uh, but it's a fascinating book because a lot of the folks that, whose projects are there as case studies are kind of second generation developers who opted not to build what their dad built, which was CVSs across a three state area. I'm kidding. Okay. So HUD's data from uh, 2014, 62% of the housing units in the United States are single family houses. Does sound about right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Arthur C. Nelson, the, the demographer, uh, using census data, his idea is that everyone who's going to want to buy or lease some real estate of any kind uh, has been between now and 2030. Those people have all been born and counted. And we have a pretty good idea what happens as they move through the various stages of life. And one of his findings is that on a national basis, 83% of households by 2030 in eight years are going to have zero children in them. Now, a more uh, disturbing statistic is that by 2030, 63% of households will only have one person living in them. And we have been building three and four bedroom houses for the last 40 years. So there are going to be a lot of people sort of settling to stay in their big house because they can't find uh, a viable, another choice that works for them. Uh, maybe they can't drive anymore and they're in a house that's kind of out on the edge of town and you would have to get in a car to get an aspirin. You know, uh, so they're looking often for a place closer in to services, churches, grocery stores, the doctor appointment and the like. But we don't really have a fit. And there's really nothing you can substitute for housing. I mean, if you could, if you could just buy a third car and then that would take care of it, right? I decided I didn't want to buy a house, I bought a pickup truck and I'm going to live there. It's not realistic. You know, there's no, there's no substitute. There's no alternative, right? The, uh, so this is a, 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 an unfortunate tale from a very exotic place. This is uh, what's going on in terms of housing production split out by the types of housing in Atlanta, right? So this is what's been built. Um, ADUs, little accessory dwelling units, the little backyard cottage for your um, for your sister-in-law, so she's not in the third bedroom. I mean, I love, I love her, but you know, it'd be better. And her dog? Oh my God! So, oh uh, well, look, we did. Last year we did 700 houses. Okay, to put this in perspective, there are 50,000 people a year net moving to Atlanta. And we built 74 houses last year, uh, 730 houses. Uh, we built a very minor number of duplexes. And we're building garden apartments and miserise and towers. Okay. But again, 50,000 people moving to Atlanta. So here's the actual demand compared to what we're producing. So we need to be able to come up with more of these choices in the missing middle. We need to figure out how to do that. Because we can't care. I mean, you, there are only so many cranes available in the world or in the US, right? So, and you need a crane to do this stuff. Also, you need a lot of capital. It's going to take up a full block or a half block. It's going to be 200 units. It takes a lot of capital. Uh, and it takes a, you know, a fairly sophisticated builder. 
It's not something that I'm going to get together with my brother-in-law, the drywall guy, and we're going to build it. You know? So a lot of people are basically out of the running for this larger scale stuff. OK. More bad news. So are you familiar with the term the wealth gap? So you know, your, the, your net worth, you sell all your stuff, and you pay all your bills, and what you have left over is your net worth, right? So the median net worth for a white household in the United States is $171,000. Sound about right? Yeah. $17,000 for black household, 21 for Hispanic. It's like 10 times below that. And a lot of this has to do with housing. Because if you didn't have uh, parents that could help you with the down payment, then you might not have gotten into the, into the system, right? Uh, so this is like a little snapshot of a problem that has got a lot of layers to it. But you can see how much that might impact housing. So and this shows kind of graphically the difference between 17,000 and 170,000. And it's been consistently going up for white households and kind of bumping along for black and Hispanic. It's kind of the reality that we're actually living in. So what could you do? What would it look like? I mean, this is uh, a set of four fourplexes. Each of them is 25 feet wide. Uh, there's a one bedroom and a study on the ground floor, two studios on the second floor, and a two-bedroom on the third floor. So that is 16 units on a 100-foot lot. So if you're counting density, uh, that's a lot. But density never really tells the whole story. It's a good way to have a number with a decimal place. You can argue about why you don't want any ugly buildings. Oh, it's too dense, right? That's not how we live. We're a more rural community, et cetera. Um, so if someone argues about the difference between a third acre lot and a quarter acre lot as if it was life and death, it's kind of abstract. It's like you could have a, an unfortunate, ugly house on either one of them, right? I mean, in terms of density, I mean, there's really no difference between me and, and Brad Pitt, right? You know, <laughs> roughly six feet tall, less than 300 pounds. You know, our zoning is like white male one, you know. Right? But for some reason, people find Brad more engaging and pay him more money. So, so you know, here's a very traditional townhouse, and then there's a really edgy one. It's a, so when we talk about, this gets us into a discussion about building types, right? And when we're talking about building types, if we were, if we were gonna apply the same kind of conversation to automobiles, vehicles, right? A coupe is a two-door car. Uh, a hatchback has a hatchback, a sedan is four doors, a station wagon is recognizable, a pickup truck, a minivan, you know, those, those are types. Now, they could be all kinds of different styles. They could have wood paneling on the side. It's always trendy for a while. Uh, they could be made by Ford or Chevrolet or Toyota or Porsche, right? And the prices will vary wildly. But a coupe is a coupe is a coupe. A pickup is a pickup is a pickup. Right? There's a cab, there's an engine in the front, there's a bed in the back of various lengths. And there's either two wheels in the back or four. I would imagine around here there's a fair number of dualies. So, and then here is again, uh, these are townhouses that are live works where there's somebody's office on the ground floor and then somebody's apartment upstairs. So, and these are recent builds. This is in Oklahoma City. Uh, and then this is a, a three apartments over a over a barber shop uh, built by a recovering architect friend of mine. Uh, and they live on the top floor. And he financed this with an FHA loan. Because for the purposes of agency loans like FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, one to four units is a house. It's the same mortgage you would get for a house. So we're, a little, little call and response going on here. Uh, one to four units is a house, okay? Not an elaborate commercial loan. You get a construction loan, you build something like this, 
you can get a regular mortgage and pay off your construction loan. The nifty thing about it is if you are building two other units and a barbershop, the bank will give you credit, will consider 75% of the rent from those units you're not living in towards your income to qualify for the mortgage. So, you know, for a young person just starting out or someone uh, recently divorced or, or widowed, um, it's a good option because you may not be able to afford a house on your own, but you can if there's some other folks living in it in their own units. Again, just one more choice. Um, oh, I love these. Uh, you may have heard the term ADU, accessory dwelling unit, for the, the little granny cottage in the backyard, or maybe a wing attached to the back or a basement apartment. This is the accessory commercial unit, right? Just a little shop scabbed onto a, 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 a cute old house, or in that case, a rather small cafe. Okay, so we talk about mixed use, that means you are mixing some kind of, typically some kind of commercial office, retail, uh, shoe repair, barbershop with <laughs> residential. You know, uh, this is a mixed use donut shop uh, and the family that opened this donut shop sold their house, got an SBA loan to build this. They live in the one, they lived for the first year with their two kids in the one bedroom apartment on the backside while they got their, business, their donut shop up and running. They now have three. They bought another house again, and they rent out the apartment in the back to their most key employee in the donut shop. So this is a local, this is in uh, the Dallas area, uh, Midlothian. And I mean, for the most part, it's hard to swing a dead cat in Dallas without hitting a donut shop, right? I mean, they're everywhere. That and snow cones, right? They're everywhere, and tacos. So, I mean, you could have like a, a Dunkin' Donuts franchise, get net worth of about $500,000, maybe, maybe you're a dentist. You could own, you could, you could get, you could get, well, it's kind of a full circle thing. You know, cradle to dental chair, yeah. Um, you, could, you could have a Dunkin' Donuts franchise if you, if you have a net worth that's high enough, right? And the folks at Dunkin' Donuts, uh, they'll give you the whole business model. They'll provide you with the uh, napkins that are, have Dunkin' Donuts printed on it, right? And they'll teach you the dark science of how to fry dough and smear sugary stuff on it. You know, it's, like, it's a big secret, right? Uh, and you can hire a manager for $45,000 a year and have a bunch of uh, high school kids, minimum wage, and that's kind of the extent of the economic development that happens. Um, these folks own a building that could be used for all kinds of things if donuts are suddenly out of fashion or there aren't enough dentists to go around and you got problems. So this is a modest little building, you know, 24 feet wide, sits on a corner. Uh, it's across the street from seniors' apartments. Um, so I always feel really youthful whenever I go there. <laughs> Okay, so I told you there was gonna be a quiz, right? So on the one side, this is what we call a cottage court. And it's four little cottages, right? Uh, very popular with single professional women, right? Uh, no attached walls, nobody living above you or below you, right? You know, light and vent, sunlight all the way around, chance for a little garden, a little fenced yard for your dog to do their business if you, aren't dressed to go outside. And then that is a little mixed-use building with four units and a little bit of commercial in it. And with those FHA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, BA loans, all of those will let you have at least 35% non-residential. So you get four apartments and then one office. And that is a house, right? 30-year loan. Now, if it's five units, Oh, that's a commercial loan. That's five or seven years, and you gotta go back and refinance kind of thing. So, and these are both fitting on a 100 by 100 lot with an alley in the back. So, four units, four units plus a, a little commercial piece. Bunch of parking on the street. You know, this is kind of a, the cottage court is like the, the gateway drug for missing middle, because 
they're cute and cozy. You just, like the, you just want to hug this little, little cottage, right? It's like the idea, somebody that builds cottage courts, is, it's very hard to describe them as a developer, right? You know, no matter how fancy a leased car you show up in, it's like, oh, you make those cute little cottages. Yeah, my sister in law loves that. Uh, this is a 20 foot deep, 20 foot by 36 live work unit. So there's an apartment upstairs, an apartment downstairs that also, it's, a, it's like a studio plus a workspace with one handicapped bathroom in it. And because a live work is a building code says that that's a residential unit, um, you can build it under the international residential code, which means no fire sprinklers which can be a deal breaker. Now, people in the fire sprinkler business will tell you, oh, fire sprinklers are that expensive, two, three, four dollars a square foot, once you get the line into the building. The tap, the, you know, the, the red trombone thing that goes in the riser room, the flow alarms, the back blow preventers, all that stuff, you know, if you're not spreading it over 20 units, it's really expensive, you know, per square foot. But this is in Memphis. Uh, it's a new build across the street from the firehouse that uh, uh, my friend has. And this is a cottage court. You know, these are 700 foot, two bedroom, one bath apartments. And we have 28 of these in various sizes in three courts that are connected with the gravel, you know, basically a gravel driveway. And we built it in a zoning that was considered highway commercial on a flag lot behind the laundromat, which is a dog grooming place. Also, they have a place where you can hose the dog off yourself if you want. And then uh, uh, a, an auto repair place, which is like an orange metal building run by an 80-year-old guy. And then behind us is the CSX Railroad, right? So we're building these little cottages. This is in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. And so you, we can rent you a 500-square-foot one-bedroom for one and a half times what an 800 square foot one bedroom would cost in the garden apartment complex. I think garden apartment complex sounds like a psychological condition myself, but <laughs> no one asked me. Uh, and this one is the one my wife and I stayed in for uh, four months because I couldn't handle the weather in the winter in Portland. And, you know, we, it's, uh, this is 512 square feet. We were quite happy there. Uh, and it's a great neighborhood. There's a po' boy place that you can walk to from here. And so, and here's a little cottage court in, actually this is in Norfolk. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of painting houses white because you don't have to change the color of what you're painting for the trim, just all white. I'd like to think it's a more dignified way to go, as well as a money saver. Uh, and then back to our, our little place in Ocean Springs. Okay, so how does this get regulated if you're building something that is kind of an oddball thing compared to single family houses or you know, big condo buildings? And the way it gets regulated, this is what they call a form-based code, right? So there's still, uh, in the zoning code, there's still a, a table of what you can use the building for, you know, uh, an office, a nightclub, uh, you know, where that, can, where that can go in your plan. But the way it's regulated for form, it says that there's this building envelope, you know, where's the setbacks, okay? Uh, is there on-street parking? Is there a garage? Where do you put it? How's the driveway work? Can you have a stoop or a porch that sticks out? How tall can it be? Is it limited by stories or by actual feet? So that's the list of stuff that you're gonna, you're gonna wanna manage. And the thing is that in most zoning codes, you have to search between 17 different pages to come up with each one of those pieces of information. The nice thing about a form-based code is it's laid out for you really diagrammatically. Um, there's a lot less interpretation involved. So it's, in some ways, it's simpler. In other ways, it's a little more demanding. You know, you, if you're gonna build on smaller lots at a higher density, realistically, you need to perform at a higher level of design and delivery. It needs to, you need to step up your game. You can't just show up in your sweatpants, need to wear a proper sh collared shirt, you know, you know, like a nice golf club. So, so here's an example of how 
a townhouse is shown, this is where it goes on the lot, that's where the parking is, you know, here's here kind of the tail of the tape, and there's how you would code for a cottage court. You know? So a cottage court, if you just describe it with like four paragraphs, it sounds, you know, it's like in your mind's eye, imagine little buildings that face on a walkway in a common area, and they all have their own little yards, and they, it's like, what? Draw it for me. Okay, so it looks kind of like this. And actually, almost always in the planning documents and in the uh, missing middle book, cottage courts are always shown on nice rectangular sites. But in reality, they work really well on oddball, amoeba-shaped sites that are behind the laundromat or, you know, wherever. Um, but this makes it a lot easier to understand as a kind of a simple model. And then this is what we call frontage, right? This is how you understand how the building kind of uh, does its job when it meets the street. So you could have a porch, you could have a, an engaged porch, you could have a stoop, uh, you know, various ways to handle how your building meets the street. And that's really important because in a traditional neighborhood, typically the street kind of works as a, uh, as a public space, a shared space, right? And so you kind of, your backyard might be a little rumpled, but in front, you're supposed to iron your, your building, right? Because you've got company coming, right? And so the, the buildings kind of form that outdoor space. They're like the walls on an outdoor room. And if you go to a, uh, a neighborhood, uh, well, like the, the gridded neighborhoods around here, um, the, the houses kind of hug the street. Uh, most of them are roughly you know, along the same frontage. And it, uh, it really kind of, it's a difference between that and the sort of neighborhood where uh, all the houses have a garage that sticks out the front. The rather unsympathetic term for that is a suburban snout house. <laughs> uh, planners are cruel people, I just, uh, you know. And, and with a garage forward house, it's often the case that the two-car garage uh, becomes a one-car garage because there's this glacier of, of bicycles that need repair and stuff you bought from Costco that start to squeeze in. And at some point, actually, you just moved into the house and there are boxes you have not unpacked for four years that are still in the garage, which is why you park in the driveway. It's a normal human thing. We all get a little mini storage when we get a garage. Uh, and, well, and unless we're actually working there, we tend to have it be kind of the loading dock or a really large scale junk drawer. You know, <laughs> it's like your junk drawer where you have like half of a pair of scissors because you're going to find the other one soon, you know, <laughs> or uh, expired pizza coupons, you know. All right, well, more bad news. If we require too much parking, just to be on the safe side. And I've heard from uh, some uh, planning staffers in different cities that they've set those numbers so that they don't get a lot of phone calls complaining. And if you're worried about phone calls from your city of 40,000 people, you may be bloating the parking lots of lots of buildings <laughs> just to make sure you didn't get any phone calls. So, you know, if you have a, uh, a 10,000 foot office building, and the requirement in your zoning code is three spaces for every thousand feet. You know, the parking lot is as big as the building, right? Um, it's not a good way to, to build your tax base. Uh, it's an excellent way to create uh, flooding issues and stormwater issues because you got all that pavement. Uh, well, here's you know, here's a retail piece, or a restaurant, or a bar even more parking, right? So if every place is isolated from every other place, and this is the place where you only live, and over there is the place where you only go to church, and this is the place where you only go to high school, the place where you only go to the drugstore. In a suburban setting, in a conventional, you know, ever since World War II setting, all those places where you only do one thing are connected by a trip on the only road that actually will get you to all those places. So 
if you spread civilization fairly thin on the land, you could end up with a very high level of congestion with not that many people involved because everybody's on that same street. Now, compare that to the traditional neighborhoods uh, of Castroville, where how often do you actually encounter another car when you're driving down one of these local streets? And you're probably driving at a speed where you can recognize who's in the other car. Now you get out on 90, can we talk about 90? Yeah. You get out on 90, you can't recognize people in another car. There might be somebody you went to high school with, you can't tell. It's like, that guy in the Buick cut me off. Or, the Buick cut me off, because I can't tell the gender of the person in the car. So it's, in some ways, it's a way to be isolated for other people. And if you live in a small town where you value your connections with other people, for better or for worse, you know, uh, flipping them off in an automobile, you know, you, you, you're too close to other people to do that. So it's like it moderates your behavior. It's a good thing. It should moderate your behavior. I saw you smiling. <laughs> okay, so this is a gimmick we came up with some years ago. It started out on a series of bar napkins describing, well, what could you build in the missing middle? Because most people are thinking, well, there's probably five or six kind of buildings you could use for infill in a, in a neighborhood you respect, right? Uh, we stopped at 50. And so this was a, a design workshop. That's a planning director. That's the economic development guy uh, pretending to be really, really, in I took the picture. He was really excited about this, right? So he's kind of muffing a little bit. But these are the cards, 50 cards. This is an, uh, an alley-facing townhouse. Uh, and you can go to some cities and some towns that have those, and they're just part of the, you know, part of the furniture. Uh, but again, 50 different possible things. It isn't just a townhouse or a live-work building or a little mixed-use building. Uh, there's all kinds of things that can be done if our rules allow them. And if we give people good direction about, no, no, you can do a whole bunch of these. Now, my favorite uh, kind of party trick is to take all 50 of them, you do this with, with planning directors, and it's a two drink minimum. You, you spread them out on the table, and it's like, wow, these are amazing, this is great. You know, and and it, it, you, you don't feel like you need permission to pick them up and fool with them, you know, so it's really engaging, right? It's like, these are great. Wow, it'd be so raising. You know, it's like, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, your zoning won't allow you to have, of the 50, yeah, we need to take 37 of them off the table. They're illegal in your town. You happen to have a number of them built in real life, but you can't do it because you kind of put suburban zoning over the old part of town. So now if you want to build the way we used to build, you got to get special permission and get variances and have public meetings and all your neighbors within 500 feet get a cryptic phone uh, uh, postcard, you know, <laughs> come to a public hearing about a really scary thing, right? Because it's written with acronyms and, you know. But so then we're down, we're down 37, so we get 13 left. And say, oh, I'm sorry, you don't have 13. You have six because these other seven, you're not gonna be able to finance uh, with the rents that are available in your town right now. So like, six. A minute ago we had 50. How do we get those back? No, oh, funny you should ask. Oh, all you gotta do is change a few of your rules. And you know, it's gonna be consistent with your comprehensive plan and all your big idea policies, but because you never got around to changing your zoning to bring it in line with your vision and your policy, Actually building your policy is illegal, unless you ask for special permission and have a public hearing. So you can build the stuff that you're not crazy about, and you said in the policy document, let's do less of that and more of this. You can do the less of that stuff as of right. You should get a building permit, right? The stuff that consistent with your policy, that is like what you meant to build, you gotta ask for extra special permission. So here's an alley facing uh, townhouse in theory, and here it is in reality. This one again in Norfolk. There's three townhouses, each with a one-car garage and a 900-square-foot two-bedroom apartment with an office on the ground floor. 
you know, cute as buttons. Uh, the, the venerable ADU, accessory dwelling unit. The, uh, you know, in my city, I can add on the, the guest suite, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, I live in East Point, Georgia, which is like 35,000 people in between Atlanta and the airport. Yeah, and I live in a 700 square foot little house with my wife and my mother-in-law who has dementia. And so we're gonna build a wing onto the house for her to live in because if I wanted to build a cottage in the backyard, I'd have to go all the way to the city council, right? And all my neighbors within 500 feet would get a postcard and the like. So this is a real, uh, this is kind of a baby step. The ability for somebody to put a small building behind their principal building. Um, I actually helped a neighbor lady do this. Um, she didn't want to climb stairs anymore. So she had her son-in-law build uh, an at-grade accessible unit in the backyard, and then she rents out the house she used to live in. But now she has the kitchen and the closet she always wanted, and her bastard husband wouldn't let her, you know, yeah, she's a widow lady. But. I don't know what her role in that was. <laughs> I've heard some terrible stories. I, I'm sure he deserved it. So this is kind of the, the, big, the big daddy of the missing middle. Three stories, no elevator, uh, commercial on the ground floor, apartments upstairs. Um, now, the, in addition to building codes and zoning codes and what, the, what kind of financing you can get, a developer working in these small buildings also needs to pay attention to something called the Fair Housing Act, which prevents you from, from discriminating against folks that are disabled. So the Fair Housing Act says that uh, in a building like this, if you decided you're gonna make the ground floor an ice cream shop and a pizza place, and then there's no residential on the ground floor, if there's four units or more in the building, that means that the ground floor for the purposes of the Fair Housing Act is now on the second level. And all those units have to be accessible. So you need either a big change in grade or an elevator, which is gonna be hard to do in a building that's only 10 or 12 units. It's hard to amortize that kind of cost. Plus, this is about the biggest building you're gonna build with residential trade contractors. I mean, in my neighborhood, Jerome and his nephew are my plumber and they have a van with a different color fender. They're excellent plumbers, but it's a modest little operation. So if I wanted to build something bigger than this, I would have to like go to the plumbing company that has uh, seven trucks and 30 guys. Wait, I met a plumber this morning. Yeah, there we are. And I saw all her trucks. And I was thinking, this, I'm really jealous. I can never find Jerome. And I was like, look at this. And if you're competing for plumbers, which are kind of the, the scarce resource these days. You know, I can find flammers all day long, but plumbers are a little rare in my neighborhood. Um, and so to see that many plumber trucks at Sammy's, you know, it's like, oh, like watching $20 bills blow down the street. It was great. So, so if this building has one unit on the ground floor, maybe added from the side or from the inside, that'll take care of the Fair Housing Act and now you have an accessible unit. So this is one we designed with exactly that in mind, three stories. Each of the upper floors has four units, four units, and then one in the back. And the ground floor looks like this. So a small commercial space, a medium-sized one, and one accessible one bedroom, right? So what the Fair Housing Act tells us is that in a non-elevator building, all the ground floor units have to be accessible, adaptable, in this case, all one of them. So building the missile metal as a, as a, as a practical matter, uh, you're always looking for workarounds and hacks and things that are technically legal but are unusual. You know, this is not a common kind of building. Usually it's either all commercial on the ground floor or all residential down to the ground. Uh, so again, here are the, uh, uh, the books you ought to have. And so there's uh, Shop House Studios is where you can get yourself a set of the 50 cards, 50 shades of infill. Uh, 
my blog, Arch on the Bad. The story there is we were working after, uh, on the recovery planning in Mississippi after Katrina, and it was a large team, and there were two people named John Anderson. And the guy running the show got really fed up with that, because he would say, and we were working within 20 feet of each other. And he would say, John Anderson, and it'd be, what, yes? And it was like, so after three days of that, he said, this is unacceptable. Little five foot six Cuban guy. This is unacceptable. From this point forward, you should be known as John Anderson the Good. And you, of course, John the Bad. So it's the best nickname ever because it lowers people's expectations. <laughs> I show up and I'm a decent human being, and they're like, no, no, he was a teddy bear. It was great. You know, it's like, oh, it's like, I read his blog, he sounds so angry, you know. Uh, we also have a Facebook group with like 10,000 people in it that are working on these sort of projects in their neighborhoods. Uh, and this is my email. If you want to tell me what I got wrong in today's presentation or ask for help on any of this stuff. So now I'm going to vamp a little bit while I change to the piece that I want to talk about, I-90, or Highway 90. So, so I'm going to give you about 10 or 12, 12 minutes about how do we get into the situation with the zoning rules that we have. Um, it's kind of a dramatic and tragic tale. And then after that, we're going to talk about corridors of crap, which was the term coined by, and we all know what we're talking about, right? You know? I mean, you can go anywhere and say, you know, a corridor of crap, and people are like, oh, like Murphy Street. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, the former mayor of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, coined that term. He was a one-term mayor, but, <laughs> but a hell of a guy. Um, so, okay, first the earth cooled, then the dinosaur, no, the, uh, the history of planning. Um, there was a, a point, uh, turn of the century in America, where uh, there were folks living in tenement buildings next to stockyards and hog rendering plants and steel mills and stuff. And if you live, if you place where you live is so close to that kind of poisonous stuff that's going on, and you work there too, like lots of people got sick and died because of where they lived and what they were next to. So planners became incredible heroes through the exotic process of zoning when they said, you know what, the hog rendering plant should be over there, and you should live far enough away from that that you don't get sick and die. Okay? And we've sort of uh, taken this a bit too far, because now we consider a duplex the sort of noxious, terrible land use that, you know, it's like a steel plant. I can't, like, I can't live anywhere near a duplex. So we have separated things uh, and then connected them with a trip on the roadway. So, but those rules are somehow in place all over the country. But they're local ordinances. How did that happen? Well, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover was Secretary of Commerce. And for the sake of, uh, of health, safety, and the general welfare, Herbert Hoover wrote model legislation so that they would send it to state legislatures, and the state legislature would pass the legislation that would give local municipalities the police power, the authority to control how land was used. 1930, right? So around that same time, uh, you could not get a 30-year mortgage. You might be able to get a 10 or 15-year one from your local building and loan society, like with George Bailey and His Wonderful Life. You know. uh, and it would be like 50% down payment. Right? Which, which is why families, families would leave houses to their children, because it was finally paid off. Right? Uh, and it, we created a situation where actually neighborhoods were very stable because it was really hard to get money to buy a house. You know, uh, it was a serious thing. So the government came up in the 30s. They came up with the Federal uh, Housing Administration, the FHA. And they wrote rules that said, we'll lend you, we'll, we'll get you a guarantee on that 30-year loan from your local bank if it meets these standards. The catch is, you need to use that loan to buy a brand new house, because we want to create jobs. It was the Great Depression. 
We own a print shop, so a brand new house, we can get you one of these 30-year loans. And that brand new house needs to be actually in a brand new subdivision that's laid out according to these model standards. So the, the federal government's guarantee for the 30-year loan now filters down to, well, we better have zoning that matches these standards so people can get loans. So, and then they went a little further. They said, you know, in addition to, you know, new houses in a new place where it's just one thing, just a house, Levittown or whatever, uh, the streets have to be a certain way too. So, this, so, so what y'all have around here, the, the connected network of streets, we're not going to do that. We're going to do local streets, loop streets, cul-de-sacs that feed onto a collector that nobody's front door faces, the people's back fence, right? So you got this road that now goes way too fast, and it's got transformers and things along it, and a privacy fence. We've all seen these, right? Maybe you've got a four-foot sidewalk with uh, utility poles in the middle of it so you can't get your wheelchair around it. You know, two, two different, different departments, departments they never got together, together to talk. talk. So uh, that approach is how we built everything after World War II. You know, because now you get a GI loan for a new house and a new subdivision. And as folks left the cities, uh, light flight, uh, also those 30-year loans, they weren't available to black and brown folks. That was actually written into the federal legislation. So, you, you want to know where redlining came from? Federal, federal government. government. Because in 1930, a lot of folks thought segregation was a reasonable approach. And so, the rules that went out to the state governments to, to set up that you know, cities can have their own rules, had that stuff baked into it. And we are still kind of living with the result. You know, and we have places that are only single-family houses with only a lot size, uniform lot size. So we do get kind of uh, people within plus or minus $20,000 in income living in the same place. Um, and it's kind of done for efficiency if you're a home builder. It's a lot easier to do it that way and focus on just one kind of customer. Because let's face it, people lose their ever-loving minds when they buy a house. Right? So, so if you, you can, can just get used to selling houses to doctors and dentists and trophy wives, you know, that's like a niche. You can like, you know, the, uh, and, and they'll spend a lot of money on upgrades. So as opposed, if you're going to do starter houses, you have like a limited palette and you, you know, people are really deliriously happy to get the house and you just do a good job so you don't have a lot of warranty issues. And it would be great if you get it close to jobs. But again, it's a niche, right? So. Nowadays, the opportunity to look at uh, tailoring our zoning to the kind of places we really do want to build. What are the best models we could look at? What are the most successful neighborhoods you've seen? You know, uh, how could you write a code that would build more of the traditional neighborhoods of Castroville? You know, that's actually doable in the modern age. We can do that. So that's kind of how we got to where we're at. At the same time, uh, Eisenhower comes back triumphant from World War II, and he has seen the Autobahn system, the freeway system in Europe. And, you know, you can move a lot of tanks really fast over a lot of ground if you have a freeway system. And we didn't have a freeway system. We had a lot of competing railroads, and that was kind of confusing. It made it hard to get parts from one part of the country to another to make bombers or tanks or whatever. So it was a national defense issue and a jobs program. We had the Highway Act. We also, with the Highway Act, we decided we're going to build freeways, but we're also going to classify all the streets the way we do for the suburbs, the way we did for the GI Bill housing and the FHA housing. So the way that we organize streets has become kind of a one-size-fits-all, kind of abstract and kind of brittle, fragile kind of model. And because all those streets that don't connect very much feed onto the only street that goes somewhere, you bring a lot of customers in a concentrated way. You know, I mean, where do bears get salmon, right? At the falls, where they become vulnerable and jump out of the water to get up. It's like, so I mean, bears are not that industrious. They're they're looking for 
calories kind of with minimal effort, right? So same with Dunkin' Donuts. Same with the chicken restaurants you guys seem to have so many of. They're not located two blocks off of Highway 90. They're right there, you know, and they all want to drive through, right? So you end up with this little building in the middle of a bunch of asphalt, right? And some unfortunate soul actually walks in there now, but most of us, because of COVID, we do the drive through the, uh, and while we're in the drive through line, we complain about, this is really dumb, you know. Like, I don't see my friends at Sammy's anymore, you know, kind of, but we're always doing drive through chicken. So corridors of crap became really ordinary because you have all those customers, and now you can have a Walmart, a Dollar General, a Jiffy Lube, you know, the, the sort of, you could be anywhere, you know, and you know, it's like a Hampton Inn, it's a Hampton Inn, it's a Hampton Inn, right? And actually, if your neighborhood bar and restaurant is an Applebee's, you probably live in the suburbs. You know, it's not a place with local flavor, right? So we have created these corridors that it makes it really work economically to have a bunch of customers coming by your store. And then we make sure there's plenty of parking. And what ends up happening is you have very little civilization and a lot of kind of, uh, well, like a sewer for cars, you know, or I'm sorry, a pipe for cars, you know, right? And if you make it wide enough, uh, I mean, a DOT's job, I, I, to con for background, I served three years of very hard time in the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And I served in the department called Access Management. Anybody know what happens in the Access Management Department? Well, in the Access Management Department, the whole theory is that the state's roads will provide a balance between mobility to go someplace and access, which means you can turn left across traffic without getting killed. But if you're busy going someplace fast, turning left across traffic becomes kind of a problem. And for people that are in the highway department, I'm sorry, the Department of Transportation, it's, it's a hierarchical, almost military, male-dominated arrangement. What could possibly go wrong, right? And there are people that have campaign ribbons from, like, building the last urban freeway in Minnesota, right? You know, and those are the old silverbacks, right? The, and the kid, yeah, you don't know. You just got to manage the state highway that goes through that town. Right, the right. town. It's like, tch, fooey, right? So, in the mind of a person who trains as an engineer that's going in a straight line, looking to move lots of vehicles from point A to point B, that's what they've been told to do. The idea that you wanted to create civilization, you know, when that thing runs through your town to get to the, you know, to the military base or whatever, they tear that thing through the middle of your town, uh, they're trying to get mobility. Not, not so much access. access. So, so access, access management, management, those are the people, they're more planners in that department than engineers, which, you know, right, right, right away you're the redheaded red stepchild, right? right? You're, you're not a real engineer, engineer right? Your, Your job is to negotiate how many driveways can happen on a state highway. And your boss will tell you, you tell them what number you're thinking, and they said that number is too many. See if you can consolidate driveways. Make, make them connect, connect their parking lots together, you know, uh, and, and nobody can have a driveway within 127 feet of the intersection, intersection. because you know, 127, you know, we, we've, we've engineered, it's a, actually 127.6 feet, you know, it's a precise thing. Engineers love decimal places because it, it gives them a feeling that it's really been worked out. So they throw a decimal place on there to, you know, fool their boss. So, so my, my job was to make sure that somehow, we, when the state highway went through town, that we weren't taking the parking away from in front of somebody's hair salon because we wanted to get all those customers out of town really fast, right? Or someone from one end of town going to the other end of town and the other streets don't connect, they have to get on the state highway. So with trucks, semis and such. So it's, it's really, it's a culture that creates corridors of crap, and, and the people that work in those departments are really angry about every McDonald's that goes in because it's making their highway 
not a real highway. So the people who get assigned to work on places like Highway 90, they are very low in the food chain and a DOT. You know, they're, they're not the rock stars. They're not building you know, overpasses that fly through the air like the guy in Houston. Not those guys. Not much concrete being laid. Lots of public meetings where everyone's mad at you. That's, that was my life for three years. OK, this handsome gentleman is walking down what's called the recovery zone on a state highway. The recovery zone is, in case you were texting to tell you you were on the way, and you slip out of your lane, and now you're on the recovery zone, and you can get back, right? So that's a highway concept. This is in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And this is like at 4 in the, you know, I don't know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday or something. Not much traffic going on, because uh, the road is closed for repaving. And they were going to put in a big stormwater facility because, because the, the neighborhoods to either side of this flood like crazy. Uh, there's not a lot of rain in Mexico, but it comes in like three days, you know, monsoons, right? And so there's a lot of flooding as a function of that. So they were going to put uh, a stormwater facility down the street, which means they were going to tear up the street, and uh, all the people that had businesses up and down the street were really worried that maybe they would be out of business. But I mean, I mean, this, this is as sympathetic a picture as you can imagine of this corridor of crap. You know, uh, if, if you turn around, there's like used tires for sale or rent, you know, because, because there's, there's another, another corridor that, that has the, 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 the Trader Joe grocery, grocery store, you know, that, that you know, all the, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know how small retail gets cannibalized by the larger, larger newer retail further out, closer to the $350,000 houses, right? So, so you have the, the used to be a Kmart, now a, you know, an antique mall or, or vacant. I once saw a spotted owl nesting in the crotch of the big K in Oregon. You know, it's like the, uh, uh, so it's a terrible street that runs really fast, and they were trying to figure out what to do with it. So uh, the renderer did a very nice, sympathetic job uh, drawing, drawing this handsome gentleman, gentleman one more time. time. But, but what's, what's going, going on is you have the through streets, you know, divided, divided with the median, and the stormwater is in that. And then you had a separated bike lane, so you're ne you, there's a curb, and you're riding on a bike path that's elevated, right? And you're apart from. So the idea that, oh, well, we don't need to build any bike facilities because no one ever bikes here. That's like saying, you don't need a bridge because there's nobody swimming across the river. Typically, when you build this kind of bike facility, then people that are not comfortable riding their bike in the street start to ride their bike. And then there's, this is called the side drive, right? It's one way. Uh, and if this guy would just get out of the way, you can see uh, parallel parking in front of the stores, right, uh, with a sidewalk, right? So out here, this is 25, 30 miles an hour. This is a bike. This is like 15 miles an hour. And you, you could see the uh, high school cross-country cross -country team running counter to traffic down the side drive. Right? And I've seen that uh, in the town I used to live in in Northern California. So here it is, set up with the median, with left turn lanes every now and again, some streets that don't go through the median. And here's the side drive. And it gets repopulated with new stuff. So this is. Uh, that's, that's the, the little trailer, trailer for the used, used car lot, right? And, and that's, that's the future of the used car lot. Right now, um, they were storing, uh, this, uh, they're sorting recycling there, right? And that's a homeless shelter up at the top there. So there's going to be a big investment in this road. How do we make it so there's no longer a corridor of crap on purpose? How do we make it beautiful? So right now, I mean, in your wildest imagination, what could possibly be done to fix Highway 90, right? What's happening around the country is that those kind of streets with the center turn lane and the 14-foot drive lanes and the recovery zone and lots of driveways for used tire shops, corridors of crap are being turned into boulevards, right? where here's your storm, here's your great big stormwater pipe, here are your trees that provide shade because New Mexico is freaking hot, 
and, and you can, can see what's going on. Here are the lanes that go this way, those are lanes that go that way, and then you have the side drives. Now, this is a postcard from the town I spent 15 years in in Northern California called Chico, California. Home to Chico State, which Playboy magazine rated as one of the top party schools in the nation five years running. You can imagine. Like, and this is the gate to the Chico High School, which sits, they have a high school that sits on two city blocks with a football stadium. You know, so if your school district says they need 50 acres for a high school because everyone who's a junior or a senior drives there, there are other models, right? This is a 1,200 students high school. So here's the side drive, here's the median, here's the through lane, on the other side there's another set of through lanes, and, and this is what it looks like. So this is uh, what's coming at us, uh, that's, uh, that's the through lanes, and the other side of the vegetation is the side drive. And you can see the side drive over there. So tree canopy, you know, um, these, These are, are actually genko, genko trees, trees down, down the middle that turn yellow, yellow and then the oaks turn red on the outside. It's spectacular. Now, this street carries, as it happens, 35,000 cars a day, which is the number of cars a day you have on Highway 90. And this all fits within 120 feet. So with some tweaks, you could have something like this on the section uh, east of town. And where it gets to be uh, just 90 feet, you can end up with, instead of the side drive, just parallel parking, right? So what right now, that, that Highway 90 is a barrier from one side of town to the other. This is a seam between two neighborhoods, right? And this is a neighborhood where you can get a Sears and Roebuck house that faces onto this boulevard, the same house, two blocks away on a quiet side street on exactly the same size lot, the same house, not just a similar house, the same house, charges, it's uh, uh, the one two blocks away on the quiet side street, when I lived there, $200,000. This one, 285 on a 35,000 car a day street, which here they've turned it into a real address. Like, also, there's a parallel street called Mangrove uh, and, and that's, that's where the grocery, grocery store and, well, Blockbuster Video used to be, you know, and a bunch of banks that had drive-throughs and stuff. And there's 19,000 cars a day there. And it's, you know, four lanes plus a center turn and a recovery zone, you know. So if you ask somebody, if you ask one of the locals, which is the busier street, they'll tell you the street with 19,000 cars a day because it, it's bereft of any hope or optimism. It's just terrible. It is a corridor of crap. And this carries almost twice that amount of traffic because it's designed and executed in a way that is accommodating the cars, moving a high level of volume, in a very humane way where the, the civilization that's happening on the edges is quite comfortable. There is a place, my favorite place for live music, and bocce, because that's like a sport, like cornhole, where you can like drink and, and at the same time. It's called the Red Tavern, right? So uh, someone described the difference between walking on, this is called the Esplanade, you know? Uh, no, the Spanish pronunciation, Esplanade, no, you don't drink lemonade, you drink lemonade, so we call this, in California, we call it the Esplanade. So if you're working in the Esplanade or you're walking on mangrove, so if I'm walking on the Esplanade and my friends drive by and they say, oh, there goes John. I bet he's going to the Red Tavern to play bocce and drink. Lucky bastard, I got a meeting. You see the same, see John over on Mangrove walking by the shuttered blockbuster video, you know, with the taco wrappers blowing across the street. He says, oh, there's John. I wonder what happened to his car. Poor bastard. Same, Same function, function, right? A different, a different context, context, a different character, a different, a different physical arrangement, arrangement, a different level of investment, and a different level of tax base. This place, you know, your, your value per acre is two and three times 
what it is over on the corridor of crap. This is not a street. This is a machine that makes money for the town. It's also a machine for selling real estate. So developers and, and, uh, and the finance director are on the same page on this one. So here's a couple more shots, or not. Uh, well, you'll just have to trust me. Um, so you could have a street like this instead of Highway 90, 35,000 cars a day. This used to be Highway 99. Now it's Business 99 because they made a bypass. You OK? I hope it wasn't something I said. So now there's a sign up that says, you know, Highway 99. There's also a sign at each one of the stoplights that says, Lights timed at 28 miles an hour. So if you're a local, you cruise along at 28 miles an hour, and you don't hit a single red light, right? And you feel really clever, because people with out-of-state plates are accelerating to the red light. And then, you know, and you cruise by them, you know, because they got to get back in gear and accelerate to the next red light. So just by timing the lights correctly and posting that little piece of information, it's a tremendously humane arrangement. Uh, I'm a huge fan. And the first time I saw it, it was like, you know, how is this not everywhere? You know? It's like the first time you have uh, a proper beignet. It's like, my God, I've wasted my life. I could have been having these every day, right? It's, it's like that. So the way that this happens with the Texas Department of Transportation is you have to convince them that you're going to increase capacity because if truck cars are moving slower, less traffic, less stopping distance, you're going to increase safety because when vehicles hit each other at a high rate of speed, not only do you have more frequent accidents, you have more severe accidents and more people get maimed and killed when they're driving like 35 miles an hour or more. Someone hits you at 20 miles an hour, you might walk away. They hit you at 40, 90% chance of being dead. So the physical design is driving economics, it's driving safety, and it's driving quality of life. So if you could have a safer, uh, money-making, quality of life street, or you could have a quarter or a crap, you really need to be able to frame it in that way. You need to be able to demonstrate there are a lot of reasons to change the physical design of the street. And what happens in community after community is it just takes time to wear down your DOT. Uh, you gotta be, you gotta find somebody that has PE, professional engineer, at the end of their name on their business card, because they're in the same tribe as the people in the DOT. And they will trust that person. It's like a secret handshake, there's some kind of lip tattoo, you know, they're, it's their people, right? If a planner tells them, or a city councilman tells them something, you know, Ladies, you may have been in situations where you said something and then some man says the same thing and gets all the praise. Yeah, this is the guys with professional engineering, the lip tattoo, mostly guys. Uh, women engineers have a harder time penetrating that cloud. You know, the same information that is so obvious takes a long time to grind its way through that machine. So it might take 20 years or it might take five. The thing is that if you make a plan and you physically design it and you start pestering them, uh, somebody, some bright person in a cubicle somewhere at your local DOT district is going to say, you know what, we've got this money from the feds and the infrastructure bill about connecting communities that have been ripped apart by high-speed roadways. You know, we could just pretend that this is what's going on in Castroville and we can give them that money. So, in many ways, too often, form follows finance, right? And this is a situation where the right physical design now can meet the right funding source, and you can get this done. You know, the, uh, I'm not just blowing smoke. This is a real thing. I have seen it on the ground. I've been to an exotic college town with a great party school, and I've seen it there. So, so to make it happen in Texas, I don't, I don't know, know. you all lead the nation in so many ways. I think you probably ought to have five or six of these by now. So, 
uh, I do think you lead the nation in federal highway spending per capita. The only people doing better than y'all is Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. So I want to thank you for coming out. I'm sorry to run so late. Um, I tried to be uncharacteristically brief, but it didn't work out. So, um, so are there questions? No, no. I said, are there questions, not is there applause? So, but I understand, yes. Any questions? So I'm also ignoring what you said, and I have a comment instead of a question. Um, this missing middle stuff, there is a little bit of it in Castroville. The country villa apartments, which are right up against my backyard, are about the size of a lot of the stuff you're describing, and they, if you zoom out, it's kind of hard to tell that they're not part of the neighborhood. And they give a really neat, a lot of people don't think of them as part of the neighborhood, but I do because I lived within them before I bought my house. And they provide a really neat opportunity for people who are to, you know, start out of college and find a place and then when they're ready to buy a house, move into a house that's at the same place and sees the same people and the same businesses as where they've been living for a few years. And with more middle, missing middle housing, there's an opportunity for people, once they're done in their house, to continue living in that same neighborhood and seeing their same friends and neighbors and businesses. So I'm pro missing middle, and you can talk to that. Excellent. Well, I'm sure at some point you've heard someone, a friend of yours, talk about renters. You know, well, we don't want any renters, or I'm worried about renters. And it's like a, a vague people that's not us, right? And it's as if signing three quarters of an inch of mortgage paperwork that you didn't read transform you into a morally better person. You know, and you're not that much better off because now you are renting with debt. You and the bank, most of the bank own, own the building. The only benefit you have is that as it becomes more valuable and as you pay down the loan, you don't have to share your upside with the bank. So, yes, if you're able to be a homeowner, you have an advantage and you are probably more financially secure. But, but there, there are, are people who are renting on purpose. It's, a, it's like 2 or 3% of the rental market is what uh, uh, market study people call renters by choice. Uh, these are people who had to replace their dishwasher a few times too many when they were homeowners, right? And uh, maybe they, their job situation changed, maybe they got divorced, uh, you know, the, maybe they had a partner die. There are lots of folks that need those other choices, those other opportunities. And if those choices are shrunk down to just garden apartments, mid-rises, or single-family house. A friend of mine, who's a, who's a female obstetrician, was told by her realtor that, you know, what she should really do as a single professional woman working 60 hours a week what she needed to do was buy a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a two-car garage and a yard and a commute because that would be better for resale to someone else who doesn't really need it, right? You know, the 63% one-person households in eight years, you know, often we settle for a certain kind of house, right? So the obvious analogy for this is shoes. Right? So, uh, what, what size, size shoe do you wear? Ten and a half. Ten and a half. Okay. okay. Now, all, all the shoe manufacturers got together, and because our financing from Bank of America is highly standardized, we have decided we are going to be extra efficient and only make two sizes of shoes. Sixes and fourteens. So, Mayor's going to have to decide, is he going to cut the toes off of the sixes or shove newspapers into the fourteens? Because you've got to have shoes, right? So you settle you know, in that kind of situation. So if the only thing we're doing is single-family houses or mid-rise, you know, and, and the middle is missing, or there's so little of it that it's bid up and it's really expensive, we don't have those choices. So I think it's important to have more choices. I think it's important that we work together to create more choices. Because we all know somebody who's settling or kind of in a bad fit, you know. 
uh, the house is too big, but she doesn't want to sell it now that her husband passed, right? And she can't take care of it, and the property taxes are too high because her Social Security for working as a bus driver for the school bus for a few years is next to nothing. And when her husband passed, then she didn't get the Social Security. So there are all kinds of situations like that that there are human beings in our communities that don't fit into the houses that we're building out of habit. So we need new habits, new choices. More questions? Okay, I'm calling it. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, if you watch the video, you can grab my, my email uh, or come on up, I'll give you my card. But uh, I'll actually be back next week uh, uh, working on a little design project. So. Thanks. Thanks. Your fly is open. Excuse me, sorry about that. <laughs> so um, I wanted to thank uh, John for coming out here. The thing, yay John. Yay, John. He is uh, extremely experienced. Uh, I, I watched him yesterday give the uh, the first presentation very closely. I think that he, he told all of San Antonio about Castroville and our missing middle uh, to a sold out crowd at the Tobin Center. Uh, he's got so much experience with that section, with, uh, with the Department of Transportation, with the codes. He's been uh, a really great help. He worked with city staff. We had uh, portions of our planning and zoning, uh, one of our council members, our city staff. So he's been helping us with the code. Um, so I, I thank you for all of your assistance and everything you're doing for us. Thank you for your insight with us. Yeah. Some of it resonates incredibly well. Some of it's a little bit foreign to us. I'll wear you down, and it's okay. It's, it's a great education. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, if you've missed any questions, please make sure that you send them to us. Um, again, we're going to have a town hall in about two weeks. We've not down, nailed down the day or the location, but it will be in two weeks to give staff the opportunity to put everything together so that, um, so that we can come back to you with a very, very high level plan, some options, and uh, we'll do a recap of what we've seen. If you haven't gotten a chance, uh, thank you, Mason, for everything that you've done, putting all of this stuff together. If you haven't seen the videos, Mason has done an amazing job of putting these together. He compiles them, it takes him a few days, but he'll actually produce it so you can see the presentations, they're online. Uh, if you're not getting the emails, again, make sure that Darren Ham has your email address, um, and that way you can go back and visit them. Two weeks, we'll be back here. Thank you for your input. Reach out to your neighbors, make sure that they're aware of this, and we'll come back in a couple of weeks and um, start moving this forward. Thank you. Have a great night. <laughs>